Hello and good evening, everyone. I'm Dr. May Kennedy. I'm the social impact advisor for this film. I actually got involved due to personal experience. My father, who is deaf, actually served in federal prison for seven and a half years. So I saw through his lived experience. And my son has autism. So it's quite an honor to be here tonight to moderate this Q&A panel. We have been working with such an amazing advisor group here with the Real Abilities Film Festival and to be involved with this film. What a wonderful experience. We've been going and being involved in a variety of film festivals and been showing the film. And Michelle had been with us previously, but unfortunately she could not be with us tonight. So instead tonight, we do want to make sure that the voice is known. That critically is communication that goes in both directions. In any sort of experience in the criminal justice system, from the police side going forward. This has been an amazing communication between our hearing and deaf teammates here. We want to make sure that deaf individuals and disabled individuals have the support for communication in the criminal justice system. You see the panel that's here tonight? Atin and May Meha, the director and producer team, have been working for five years and working alongside Michelle to learn about her story. Next, we have Del Wetter, the executive producer. <laughs> Dr. Gabriel Lomas, one of our advisors on the film, and also an editor that's focusing on issues in the criminal justice system that was actually just published in 2021 by Gallaudet Press. We have Lisa Gonzalez, also an advisor on the film. She comes from the state of California and working for the, the developmental services in the California, excuse me, the California Department of Developmental Services. Okay. Next, we have Mark Fleidner. He's the director of two different programs here in New York. One is PAIMI, which stands for the Protection and Advocacy for Individuals with Mental Illness. And the other program is PATB, P-A-T-B-I, Protection and Advocacy for People with Traumatic Brain Injury. We also want to acknowledge our other team members who might not be on the panel but are here in the audience. Executive producer Rajiv Sanjvi. And also, of course, Bob and Kim Law, who are here in the film, who are a great support to Michelle and also collaborated with us and are here with us this evening. There are two different versions of this film. The one we saw here tonight. And also another one that is, has audio description for individuals who are blind that can be voiced as well. That's done by Alejandra Ospina. So I'm going to go ahead and start with some questions for the panelists, and we hope we have a little time left for some Q&A. So let me talk, start with the two of you, Lisa and May. 
So how did you first hear about the story and how did this come to be about in this film? Hi. Uh, first of all, thank you all for coming. And um, um, New York City is very close to our heart because this is where we spent eight years and uh, beginning of my life. Uh, yeah, we met Michelle through uh, uh, Rajiv. Uh, uh, Rajiv is a friend of mine, and he is the one called me one day, and he says, you know, uh, we, uh, you know, um, he didn't give me option basically. He said he talked about Kim and Michelle, and he says we, um, you know, we need to go and see them, and I think there's something you know I want to share with you. So we flew uh, together, and then Michelle and Kim. I met uh, Kim at first, and then I met Michelle. And that's where we, you know, after meeting her and, you know, we decided to tell this story. Yeah. Anything else to add, May? Yeah, I mean, during that first trip, um, Atin and Rajiv and Kim had gone up to visit Kim's mother in Panama City. And it was while they were away that something happened. And Michelle um, experienced some PTSD and ran away. And so it was actually that first meeting where they were in the car driving back and, and searching for her. And that's one of the scenes you see in the film. Yeah, it was uh, for 18 hours, basically, we are trying to find her. And, and that was, I think, the first encounter for Rajiv and me. You know, Kim Shore had another, you know, events like that before us. But that was the, the click we had together that we thought this is a very powerful story. I mean, you tell because, you know, while we are on the road, cops, um, Kim will call all those cops and no one will show up, you know. No one was there to help. So in the end, we were all together. We were able to find her 4 a.m. basically, yeah. Yeah, and after that, you know, we knew, um, we, we actually did a little sit-down interview with Michelle and learned just a little bit about her story. And we knew that we needed to work with her to bring this story to the world. And first, you know, she was very shy and fragile. And uh, it was, you know, I think the, uh, what I felt like what we built together is the respect and the space she needed it. And the one of the most, you know, um, most funny thing I remember then we start shooting something and, and she would like ask me question, what, why are you shooting me? Why are you shooting my face? You know, why are you telling me to walk and this and that? And, and I looked at her and I was like, you know, we need to figure out. So what I did is we t take the camera together. Me and Michelle, we go to the front of Kim's um, house. It was a beautiful field. And we'll go shoot birds or something else. And then we'll bring the footage into the RV because I moved in Kim's property in a different RV. And I was living them with them in the beginning. And then we added something and she see and she was like, oh, OK. And she was like, then she start opening up, you know. But the you know the journey of a storytelling was not easy. It was a first you know she was going back into the her trauma and memories, uh, but we had to always figure out the way uh, that you know uh, it's easy for her and also also we all had a lot of patience you know with her you know. So I feel like because of the love and care and space uh, we provided her and also the trust we provided her that she was really excited and at the same time, you know, it was a not easy job, but it was she was excited to share her experiences that we never thought in the beginning. Uh, I never, you know, I had no idea that what, you know, what happened to her, especially, you know, when, you know, I come from India, I was born and raised, and we don't hear any stories about deaf and disabled people or, you know, in any news or anywhere. We don't even see any movies, so we didn't have any idea. So that was very shocking to me that, you know, as an American, we go across the world and take care of our other communities and stuff, that this is happening right here in front of my eyes. Because we lived in New York City and LA, we didn't have any idea about the rest of America. So I felt like we all felt in the same way as a team that we got to tell this story. And same times, we have to tell this story uh, from you know, Michelle's perspective, she needs to involve from the beginning to the end because this is a st her story, it's not our story. I have seen this through my dad's experience going through the criminal justice system and the oppression that he experienced. 
and attend in May the way you've shared, but the impact, the crippling impact that the criminal justice system has had on Michelle, the lack of access, the way you've described it just now really gives us a very clear perspective. Del, would you like to speak on that? Absolutely. I think it's important to understand being a deaf person going into the prison system. So for example, say five years in prison, where a hearing inmate be, may be in prison five years, the exact same amount of time, but how do you get reduced time in prison? By taking classes, gaining your GED, having group, participating in group therapy, engaging in religious services, working, doing things for the prison and showing the leadership that you've made some improvement in your personality and your life. And when you get up for parole in front of their board, they can recognize all of those accomplishments. And that will count to reduce the time in prison. And you get to leave a little earlier. However, Michelle had no interpreter. She could not take classes. She could not be engaged in group therapy. She could not participate in any of those other opportunities. So there was no one there for her. And this is not only her experience. It's true of many deaf people incarcerated throughout the United States. So as a result, deaf people in prison, they're actually punished worse than hearing people who have done the same, uh, who are incarcerated for the same reason. And they ended up having lengthier, serving lengthier periods of time in the justice system. Gabe, would you like to add? Sure, yeah, yeah, thanks. Um, when I, um, I got involved with the film because I had done a lot of work in the, in the forensic com community with, with deaf and hard of hearing. I'm, I'm, I'm a child of a deaf adult, I've got deaf family, so I've been doing this work all my life and I've just come to notice that we've got this ongoing pattern. So a co some colleagues and I got together and we edited a book and one of the things that we focus on really are, um, um, that I focus on a lot is adverse childhood experiences with the deaf and hard of hearing population. And this film just fabulously illustrates it, this, the, the problem that we've got in our, um, in our systems that we've got people who experience abuse, I mean, clearly Michelle experienced abuse, horrible abuse when she was young and then the system the judicial system, the legal system, the prison system continued to uh, perpetrate that abuse throughout throughout um, her time. And um, um, there was no better storytelling than what we saw today. And uh, so the hope, the, my hope is that we can use this as a springboard to make change in these systems. Yes, thank you. Uh, Mark, I'd like to move on to you. I was hoping perhaps you can share what is a, maybe a pivotal moment that got you to pursue this work and to become an advocate? So many things in that film evoked some of the experiences that I've had at the intersection of criminal law and disability. Um, I was a sexual assault and child abuse prosecutor many years ago when I realized that um, the teenage boy who had been sexually assaulted by a teacher uh, repeatedly, um, he has fragile X syndrome, which is a, a, a disability that uh, really significantly impacts on his communication and his ability to uh, digest information. And I knew. Uh, most dramatically for the first time, but I've seen it in many events since, that my job was to make sure that the jury and the court knew him, knew how to communicate with him. And um, I, I, I have to say, if you don't mind me going off script, that I believe that this film should be mandatory <laughs> viewing for everyone in every court system in this nation. Michelle's story tells the story of the devastating impact of solitary confinement, the, um, the devastating impact of being uniquely vulnerable in prison and jail systems because you're a person with disabilities, and 
again, so resoundingly, um, the fact that we don't take time to communicate with each other and that just results in misunderstandings that rob people like Michelle of decades of their lives. So true. With that, perhaps we can go to you, Lisa. <laughs> Lisa, maybe we can go to you to talk a little bit about the Deaf Plus community and what sort of services could be impactful, and if those services are taken away from the community, what that might happen. I'm from California. I work with the California Department of Developmental Services, which is a statewide office, and it was mandated by the leg legislature there, and I believe we were the first in the entire United States. Sadly, it, it only came about in 2021. So each regional center across the state, which there's a total of 21 of them, now has a deaf access specialist, which means that our state, California, requires entitlement services. So if a person has an intellectual or developmental disability, they are entitled to have certain services, which can be support, such as day programs, job coaching, job uh, seeking skills, a person uh, who is in, in the central uh, life. And we have 40,000 out of 46,000, out of 410,000, pardon me, that was an interpreter correction, 20% of that population is deaf, which means 60%, 28,000 deaf people are now entitled to these services. And it's heartbreaking that in Florida they can't even get through this system on, on a waiting list. They can't even get services because they're on a waiting list. And I think not only the, the isolation that's in jail that's so incredibly severely impactful, and it's just heartbreaking to see that in California, the services uh, are, are being provided, but in all the rest of the states out there. People are just living day by day that they may have kind of a, a, a behavior that is triggered by certain events and that have also is compacted by autism. Also, uh, you just see the impact. So that's why I'm so passionate about this film. OK, one last question, and then we'll turn it over to the audience. If there's one thing that you would like people to take away from this, there's something that we refer to as hashtag right to communication. That's a very important movement. What would you like the audience members to take away? Yeah, May? Well, um, if Michelle were here with us today, she'd tell you that every deaf person needs an interpreter if they have to interact with any police or any guards or any situation. Um, and also, every deaf person in prison deserves and needs interpreters. That's what she would tell you all today. <laughs> yes, and I would add that as well. I'm going to put that in our newsletter when we share information. Anything that we share with you, please sign up for our newsletter so we can continue this movement. I do see a few hands that are coming up. I just want to add another ha point on that hashtag right to communication. Also, it's not just having a warm body interpreter. Every time they think that an interpreter will just show up and that's enough, sometimes you really need not only a hearing interpreter but a deaf interpreter as well. And I would also add in terms of access to communication, of course that's the first great effort. But if the person doesn't understand the communication, then that means access is not provided. Access to communication is critical, but we have to be concerned about comprehension of that communication. So considering the use of a certified deaf interpreter, a CDI, is a critical role to help in understanding the communication between parties. You can see that here, that the police officers were going to be writing down the Miranda rights to the individual, and Michelle could take that paper, and technically that's considered, quote, access to communication, but she didn't have the literacy skills to comprehend what was written. So to be able to explain in a way that is comprehensible is a big part to access to communication, and this is very a big part of this movement. So my involvement in this film and working with the film directors, of course, as a hearing individual, 
knew quite well and could understand that being having Michelle at the center of the story and let her voice be the center of this film was critical. Working very closely together to understand her experience and that her center needed to be spotlit for the world to see. And it wasn't to be able to, to turn the camera on the others in her environment that she remained the center of this focus. And I want to emphasize that they made this happen. And that was a very critical part of this entire film. And it's because of our amazing team. Okay, that we've built. I'm seeing there's a question over here. Uh, we have a microphone. Oh. Hello. Um, what an incredible film. Thank you so much. I have a quick question and something to say also. Um, what were the years that she was in prison? Was it pre ADA? Do you know the years? She, she was released in 2017 and she had a five year sentence. Um, okay. Well, that's really sad. Um, I'm retired. I worked for 13 years as the director of disability rights for inmates for Rikers Island, for New York, for New York City's Department of Correction. I was a one-person department, one person uh, in, a, in, an, in a department of thousands. Um, I finally got one other person to help me. I, I was dealing with every disability, every physical disability, including deafness. And there were a lot of things that we did do. And I would love to talk more with you about some of the things that I did do um, and that hopefully are being continued there. But rest assured, things are not as bad uh, in New York as, as we saw in the movie. Okay, next here. Congratulations. Wow, I think I cried. I'm sure everyone cried. It was very powerful. Um, I've got quickly one question. <clears throat> um, I don't know if this is inappropriate for me to ask, but is she going to get any compensation for everything that she's suffered for? Is there litigation? I mean... We've had many people ask that question, and um, I guess that's not really for us to answer because yeah. it's, it's Private. more with where Michelle's at and what's going okay. on in her life. But, yeah, <laughs> we would hope so. But some believe, too, that that's a long process. And yeah. anyways, a little bit complicated. And what does Michelle think of the film? That's my last question. Yeah, we, um, you know, we finished a rough cut of the film, and we had an ASL version, and we attend, flew it to Florida, and we rented a little theater, and Michelle got to watch it. Um, and then, you know, even the ASL version we had, like they're saying, we still sat with the, um, Colleen, the deaf interpreter, when Michelle had questions and this and that. And I would say that, you know, her main feedback was, well, right after she watched it was a tin, you know, you missed this and this and this and this and this. <laughs> and a tin said, well, Michelle, you know, we can't tell every story and you have a lot of stories. And, um, and then, yeah, you know, she, she had... <laughs> she, she was pretty upset with me that uh, there was a little more... We shot so much and why we were not able to put everything into the one <laughs> film. And she's like, you know, then I had to understand you know, I, we talked to Kim and we, we talked to her and we explained her how this is the way the story works. And and then she was like, okay, yeah. And during that um, meeting, Michelle just so happened to find her foster mother and they met and we filmed it. And her foster mother was able to provide Michelle with the photos and the little clip of her as a young girl. And then we had to go back and we edited all that in. And, you know, so anyways. <laughs> yeah, film was done a long time ago. And um, I feel like, you know, I do believe that it's, this film was supposed to, to uh, tell by us. Uh, we were just medium. But Michelle's Michelle story is so important, not only for us, for society, but on, uh, also for Michelle. And I think, uh, I think sh she's, she was super excited in the same time, too. And you know, she, when she understood the what film make, uh, making is and a story, you know how we can impact the the life of other Michelles through this story. She was energized, you know, and I think the camera did also change her change her life, you know. I think the, the camera has. I, I say camera is a, such a beautiful and powerful tool. Uh, if you any tool is very powerful, but just you need to know how to use it, you know. And I think what we did, we let the camera 
do his job and Michelle should be the one holding it, you know. This is, I want to emphasize as well, Michelle played a huge role in expressing the story. And you see here in the credits, and of course the first person who's listed there is Michelle, to be recognized. And her influence on how the story was told, how it was shared with us all here in the film, is critical. You might recognize the captioning that was uh, chosen. It was in uh, yellow. Some of them were in white and some were in yellow. And the yellow was, her, was chosen by Michelle to tell her story. And so when he first asked Michelle to draw things, she did that. And it's actually in her handwriting and is scanned up here in the film for us to see. And so we wanted Michelle to be able to see her writing, her words were literally on the screen. And I, that's one of my favorite components of this entire film. Yeah, we turn into the font, basically. Gosh, no, I think I that know. we have one last question over here. Yeah, uh, I, I just want to say thank you so much because you, you have just opened up a story that needs to be told. I worked with the um, you know, developmentally disabled for 35 years. I was the therapist. And um, one of the problems, as Kim, Kim and Bob, excellent job, mm -hmm. they pointed out the recidivism rate one of the main reasons is no one is there to listen to their story, okay? And the communication exactly. that's involved. This is not a documentary. This is an epic movie that, as you said in the training, for folks who are dealing with developmentally disabled should look at. So thank you so much. No, I've got it. First of all, congratulations to everyone. The film is incredibly powerful. And I mean, she actually played two separate roles. She played the Michelle, the being Michelle, and she also was an actress in it. So I mean, my God, I don't know how anyone could play what she went through and do it again. And being in prison, being chained, I mean, I really... I just found it so incredibly powerful, and I'm just wondering how she coped with those reenactments. I mean, how do you handle something that that's intense? I think one of the uh, you know uh, example I'm gonna give you uh, is the prison scene uh, when she goes back into the prison, and so the idea was we sat down and I said I really wanted reactment to share her world uh, through the audience. But when I said, you know, I'm, I'm finding actress, I'm not going to show her face, and I'm going to shoot, you know, down, you know, basically from chest, and we'll do all those things, and she got pretty upset. <laughs> she said, no, this is my story. Even if it was really hard when she was in, we were shooting those scenes, and, and then suddenly, you know, the, um, the chain they were putting, they couldn't open it for almost... Almost, I will say, 35, 40 minutes, they would try to figure out how to open the lock. And I think that's where we, felt, like, I was watching and shooting, and I was watching her face, and it gave me goosebumps that what she went through, you know. And so I feel like, you know, yeah, it was a hard decision, but you're right. Yeah, she was, she had, a, because of the confidence and love and care and time we all spent together as a family, I think she was able to revisit those traumas without losing it, you know. And and she did an amazing job. Yeah. And I would like to add something. I think it's a, a, an important addition to this moment that Michelle as a person is a deaf person w who has autism, which means that communication is difficult. It's very hard to express her own story. So in question, it, it's very difficult to have question and answer and have, the, and have it be resolved. You really have to elicit more of the story through extended conversation. And a lot of the way she expresses herself is through art, through visual means and reenacting what happened. So it give, you give her space to do that, and that's very critical. Uh, and nobody listened to her growing up. 
because she had so many difficulties because the system failed her because no one took the time to listen. No one gave her that space. No one let her tell her story. And I think it was very important that she had those the time with this crew. I'm just going to extend that a little bit and just uh, share that uh, you know, uh, there's an, a lot of research in that that art is a therapeutic medium, and so I don't think that she had an art therapist working with her. She just naturally gravitated to it, and then with the prompting from the team, she started expressing herself through herself through the art. And um, you know, art is fabulous because it provides like psychological safety, distancing from the trauma, tra traumatic event, and but yet it helps her to like pull out and express. So, yeah, and she's great at it, right? <laughs> Folks, I know there's so much more to discuss here. I want to ask one last question, which is give us the call to action. What do we do next? So first thing, please go to our website, www.beingmichelle.com. We need everyone to sign up for the newsletter. We'd like you to tell at least five or 10 or 15, however many people, to please sign up for the newsletter and find a way to see the film. Um, we hope to have community and educational distribution op options available in the coming months. The film is still on a long path to seek um, the distribution that it deserves. It's, um, you know, independent documentary filmmaking in the United States of America is quite a challenging endeavor, but we are determined. We have an amazing team here to bring this story to the people that need to see it. We want to have key screenings in cities across the country with lawmakers and judges and police and guards and educators and interpreters and um, you know we're going to use this film to change the way deaf and disabled people are treated in the criminal justice system but we need your help because we've got to get it everywhere so thank you for being here tonight thank you for coming this evening we have appreciated your time here tonight thank you to the panelists as well and thank you to May Kennedy, the fabulous uh, moderator. Thank you all for joining us. Thank you all. Please spread the word. Tell your friends. This film is available virtually as well, so people can see it this week through Real Abilities. Um, have a good night, and we look forward to seeing you tomorrow.